Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight we're in Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. I think this is like lesson 13 or something. I, don't, I can't keep track. Um, I don't remember specifically, but something like that. Or maybe 14. Um, but this is a crucial one. And, and we, get, we get the idea of how crucial it is when the preacher in verse 1 says, okay, here's the main point. It's kind of like stopping and saying, if you haven't got it yet, this is what I'm talking about. Right? This is what is crucial. And you remember, we have to go all the way back to chapter 5 and verse 11 when he says, after he mentions Melchizedek, he then says, you know, I want to talk more about that, but it's hard to explain and you people aren't ready for it. You know, you, you need more maturity, but I, I'm confident we can press through and, and do something worthwhile here. So we're going to talk about it. And then in chapter 7, talks about Melchizedek. But then in chapter 8, kind of a summary point, the reason we talked about Melchizedek is because this is the main point that we have a high priest who is seated at the right hand of God uh, and um, in the heavens. Now, when we were talking about um, priesthood in chapter 5, and then we had that digression or that detour, and then we came back to priesthood in chapter 7, the point of the priesthood was every priest needs to be human. So the Son of God became human in order to be priest. And that the priest needs to be called by God. And that the difference between the order of Melchizedek and the order of Levi is that the order of Melchizedek is a priest by calling. God calls them. It's not a priest by genealogy. The Levi priesthood is a priesthood by genealogy. It's a good priesthood. It served its function. It uh, did its job, you might say. Um, but there's a, another, there's a second priesthood. It's the priesthood of Melchizedek, which one receives by call, not by genealogy. And the other difference between the priesthoods, and this was the, one of the critical differences, is that the Levi priests sin and die. They have to offer sacrifices for their own sin. And then they die. And then another priest comes. And they sin and die. And another priest comes. And they sin and die. And they sin and die. But the priesthood of the Messiah, the priesthood of Jesus, is the priesthood of one who is without sin, and who has an indestructible life that is a resurrection life. Um, this priest has been perfected. The Levitical priests were not perfected. They sinned and died. They didn't rise up again. Right? But Jesus, though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having suffered, he became a priest. That's in chapter 5. So he became a priest after he suffered. And he became a priest when he was perfected. And his perfection is not just kind of an internal moral thing, because Jesus didn't need more. He didn't develop into moral perfection. He learned obedience, that's true. So there was... There was movement, dynamic. There was a dynamic character to his life. But when he was perfected is when he became the glorified human. That is, he's perfected in resurrection. Human beings are perfected with the eternal life. And that was the resurrection of Jesus. And that's the indestructible life of the priesthood of the Messiah over against the genealogical very um, uh, sinful and mortal priesthood of the Levitical order. So that's where we were last week. 
that kind of contrast between the priesthood. This week, we're going to get a contrast between not what order you're from, what is your priesthood, but where do you serve? Which is a very critical difference. And it's going to make a huge difference as we get into chapter nine next week. And, and well, the next couple of weeks in chapter nine. Because this where do you serve is another um, important difference between the Levitical priesthood and the Messianic priesthood, priesthood of, of Jesus. And that's what we'll address here. Uh, in the first half of chapter 8. But chapter 8 also introduces us to a new covenant. A lot of debate about what that means. What does it mean to talk about a new covenant? Um, is that a replacement covenant? Is that a transformed covenant? Is it a renewed covenant? And we'll, we'll have to get into that uh, tonight as well. So there's a lot of important things going on uh, in our text tonight. But the first part of it is this sense of where. Right? Where do they serve? So let's read Hebrews 8, beginning in verse 1, all the way through the end of the chapter, to verse 13. Now the main point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary and the true tent that the Lord and not mortals has set up. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Hence, it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They offer worship in a sanctuary that is a sketch and shadow of the heavenly one. For Moses, when he was about to erect the tent, was warned, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain." But Jesus has now obtained a more excellent ministry. And to that degree, he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was enacted through better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need to look for a second one. God finds fault with them when he says, The days are coming, surely coming, says the Lord when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their ancestors on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant. And so I had no concern for them, says the Lord. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. They shall not teach one another or say to one another, know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their, toward their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. In speaking of a new covenant, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and growing old will soon disappear. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Wow, there's so much to unpack here. But let's start with those, that first section before we get to the quotation from Jeremiah. Because that quotation from Jeremiah is the longest quotation in the book of Hebrews. In fact, it's actually the longest quotation in the New Testament of any Old Testament text or First Testament text. So he has a point to have this long quotation because there's something about the length of it. There's something about the data that's in the length of it that 
is important for the point that he wants to make. And when you get to chapter 10, verses oh, 15, 16, 17, which is kind of the concluding section of this didactic part of Hebrews, it ends with a quotation from Jeremiah 31. So it's kind of like, what I'm about to tell you in chapters 9 and 10, put that between, like, two ears, put it in your head between two ears, you know, Make sure you read what I am saying in the light of the Jeremiah 31. That, that's the framing. Jeremiah 31 frames everything he's about to say in chapters 9 and 10. So it's important for us to really kind of think seriously about that. But we're not going to fully think about it because we've got more to walk through but until we get to the end when he uses Jeremiah 31 again. But let's start with the where. And let's pay attention to the text. Y'all help me out here. I'm going to talk about a, okay, where is all this happening? The contrast between, let's call it the Levitical and the Messianic priesthoods. Remember, it's not a contrast of the priesthoods anymore. It's about, it's a contrast about where. So what are the, what are the characteristics of the where? Tabernacle. What? I'm sorry, tabernacle. tabernacle. All right. So we got two tents. We got two sanctuaries, right? So we have. How would you characterize the Levitical sanctuary? How is it characterized? What word describes? What words describe the Levitical? Where is? It? Yeah, it's on Earth. Okay, so it's earthy. The other's heavenly. Because I'm sorry. The other's uh, heavenly. And the other's heavenly. All right. Now, which one comes first? The heavenly. The heavenly does, right? Yeah. So we have this kind of, all right, we have this heavenly temple and the earthly temple. We have this going, and then the earthly temple has a beginning, like the building of the tabernacle in Exodus, right? And so we're thinking, what's the relationship between these two things? What, how does he describe it? How does our preacher describe the relationship between these two things? They were both sanctuaries. All right, they're both sanctuaries. They both have access to God. God is God's presence. Not that the Levitical order said, no, nah, no presence for you. No, 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 there's a presence. But it's, oh, yeah, okay. So this, this is the pattern for the copy. <clears throat> right? What does your translation say? Does it say copy? Copy and shadow. Copy, copy and shadow. shadow. Anybody have a different one? My Norris V said sketch. And or shadow. A photo of a per uh, or a photo of a person and then uh, an actual person. Well, yeah, I think we can think. Okay, here's the original, right? Yeah. Here's the original. And this is a copy. This is a photograph or um, a replica, an analog. It's not. It's not the true sanctuary. <clears throat> did, did you notice that language? Okay, this is the true one. This is the replica. And that's really important. What else, what else, what other distinctions do we see here between the earthly and the heavenly, the copy and the pattern? The earthly, the, the priests offer gifts. Okay. Every, in verse three, every high priest is appointed to offer gifts. Now, Jesus will offer a gift too, right? Now, but you're right. I mean, the contrast is going to be about the different kind of sacrifices. Right? So in chapter 9, that's what chapter 9 is going to focus on. Whereas chapter 7 was, okay, what kind of priesthood are we talking about here? Here we're talking about where do they serve? Where do the priests serve? And then chapter 9 is, okay, and what do they offer? You know, what kind of sacrifice, what kind of gift do they offer? Um, so that, that's going to be a further point. 
But in terms of the contrast between one the, man made and one man made by God. Ah, okay. One is eternal, or you might I wouldn't call it eternal, made by God. Whereas this one is human, made by human hands. Right? That would be a contrast. The tabernacle is made by human hands. Anything else you see? Maybe in terms of what does it do? Since since this is the case, what is what's the effect of this difference? That they have to have something to offer. Okay. Well, both have something to offer, right? I mean, Jesus offers himself, right? And Levitical offer sacrifices, which we'll get to that more in chapter nine. One is good and other is better. Ah, we got good and better. It's not bad and better, right? Right. Not evil and better. It's not bad and good. It's good and better. One is clear and one is crystal clear. Oh, <laughs> okay. No, that might be one way of saying it. What what is what is good and better? What what is what is the language? What is it described? Covenant. Okay, we have a better covenant. Better and what is the other better promises? Better promises. Right? So there's something about it being in the, you know, when we see this distinction, there's something about it being in the heavenly that makes this better than just being earthly. Right? Now, think about in your, in your history in Churches of Christ, those of you who grew up in Churches of Christ, what have you heard in this text most often? What oh, verse in this text did you hear most often? Old law. Uh, old law and new law. Okay. But it's not there, is it? It doesn't say that. It doesn't say old law and new law. All right. Is there another phrase that you see in chapter, this, these first five verses? Like there was a very popular book that had the title. Last section. Wow. Last section of verse five. Yeah. Behold the pattern. All right. Yeah. Now. Notice what the, if you go back to Exodus 25 and verse 40, which is what our preacher is quoting here, the pattern is not a written document that he sees. He sees the pattern. That is, he sees the original. He sees the heavenly temple. He sees the heavenly court. And God says to Moses, yeah, do a replica of that. All right? It's not like a blueprint pattern where you get architectural plans. You know, God kind of dictates the architectural plans or something like that. It's that Moses has this vision that sees the reality, that sees the original. And therefore, he is to orchestrate a management or a building, a construction of something that looks like that. Right? So it's not a written document he's talking about at all. But typically, we've tended to take the word pattern here and say, okay, that's the Bible or something like that. But that's not what's going on here. Yeah. The uh, Levitical priesthood, the sanctuary was perfect because God told Moses exactly how he was being built. Yeah. So the Messianic perfect. The Messianic is what? Perfect. Oh, yeah, perfect. Now, the, the point here, though, is the better is this could do something that that could not, right? And when we get down to it, what is it that this could not do? We talked about it last week. Could not live forever. All right. Could not deal with death. All right. Could not perfect. Could not bring perfection, which is no way of saying couldn't live forever, couldn't deal with death, couldn't destroy death. Death was just perpetuated, perpetuated. And our sins, in one sense, were simply perpetuated. Uh, we'll talk more about that in just a second. So I think that's, you know, that's what's better here. Now, when we're talking about this pattern, though, 
I thought this was a good contrast. The pattern and I'm going to call this a replica or analog. So that there's during the Levitical system, there were two operating temples. There was the heavenly temple, the original, and there was the earthly temple, tabernacle. And you might think, well, that's a Christian, that's a new Christian idea. Well, no, it's not. In Second Temple Judaism, whether you're reading First Enoch or the Wisdom of Solomon or the Testament of Levi or Philo of Alexandria, they all talk about this heavenly temple. And they all talk about it being the original. And they even use Exodus 25, verse 40, the same way our Hebrew writer does. That there was an original temple in which the, and that they would refer to the angels as priests in that temple. Why would, why is the Hebrew writer, why is our preacher so concerned about angels? We talked a little bit about that earlier, but I think we get a little better insight as to why he talks about angels. Uh, because angels were thought of as priests in that heavenly temple. And that they were making effectual, the Levitical priesthood was not effectual on its own. It depended on the heavenly tabernacle for it to be effective. And Jews knew that themselves. So this is not a new argument. Now, this isn't kind of an innovation, a kind of, oh, wow, we're going to talk about something totally new now. No, this is part of te Second Temple Judaism, that there's this heavenly temple and there's this earthly temple. But in Second Temple Judaism, the heavenly temple was ministered by angels. Angels were functioning in the court of, the, of God. Remember, that's what the preacher said back in chapter 1, verse 14. Angels are ministering spirits. Yeah, they, they do minister. Yeah, that's true. But the key here is that our preacher is making the argument that that heavenly priesthood, that order of Melchizedek, is now has its minister that is... Um, has more, I don't know what, what word I want to use, dignity, or he's the son of God, not an angel. He's a royal son. He's a king. He's not an angel. Uh, and he became human. These angels didn't become human. But this one who is in the heavenly court became human so that he could become a priest in the fullest sense of the word to be human and to be resurrected, and therefore to be the pathfinder for humanity, to be the forerunner of humanity, to go ahead of humanity, to, you might put it this way, the Son of God followed us in our weaknesses, became one of us, suffered like us, died like us, so that being resurrected, the Son of God could lead us as a forerunner, a pioneer, whatever language you might want to use for that word in Hebrews 2, into the heavenlies. And the basis of that is what that one does in the heavenlies themselves. So I think it's really interesting that as Christians, we read this, especially Christians in the 21st century, we read this and say, wow, that must be a whole new argument. He's just being real innovative here. That's that's you know that's the new revelation from God. Well, I think a Second Temple Jew would be reading this and say, "Yeah, that's true. There's a heavenly temple and there's an earthly temple." Oh, but what you're saying is that that heavenly temple now has a high priest who has been who had become one of us. 
and has been resurrected to glory and is now at the right hand of God, ministering as high priest, something none of the angels could do. And that's why the Son is greater than the angels. One of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons why. Am I making sense? Is that following me here? Tracking with me? Okay. Um, is there anything else you see in, say, verses 1 to, to 6 um, that you want to call attention to? If he was on earth, he wouldn't be a priest, right? Not according to the law, not according to the Torah, according to the Levitical order, it wouldn't be a priest. All right, let's focus in then on Jeremiah 31. And uh, the quotation here in Hebrews 8. I just wanted yeah. to see the message. I think this thing written by Jeremiah was 600 years before his age. Mm -hmm. And I think the expert in law and all that stuff, I think they missed all that. Well, in some ways they didn't. They were expecting, uh, you know, Jeremiah 31 was well known to the rabbis, well known in Second Temple Judaism, that there was an expectation that when the Messiah came, this is what the Messiah would do for the people of God. Right? The question was not um, what would be the, the particular effect of Jeremiah 31, but who's going to do that? Who is that? Who is that? When is that? Where is that? You know, those were kind of the questions that came up. But Jeremiah 31 was part of the consciousness of Second Temple Judaism. And that's why he can appeal to it in such a strong way, because he's not telling them anything new in the sense like, oh, this is a verse you never heard before. You know, he's, he's appealing to something that they already know, but trying to help us see it in a new light in the light of Jesus, the Messiah. So focus on verse 7 and 8 for a moment before we actually get into the quotation of Jeremiah. So we have this language of first and second covenant. First, second, that's the language that we have here. But when we read Jeremiah, what is it called in Jeremiah? It's not called Second Covenant, is it? What does Jeremiah call it? Yeah, New Covenant. So that's what we're talking about. The New Covenant. And he says, for if the First Covenant had been faultless, I have to remember chapter 7, verse 11, verse 18, and faultless, there would have been no need to look for a second, to look for a second. Why are we looking for a second? Well, because Jeremiah said one was coming. That's why we're looking for one. And why are we looking for it? Because the first one has some, some ineffectual dimensions. It, it didn't work, you know, in some ways. And part of why it didn't work in chapter 7 was priests die and priests sin. And that's one of the reasons it didn't work. Now, whose fault is that? Is it the fault of the covenant itself? Or look at verse 8. Now, the new RSV says, God finds fault with them. What does your translation say? Does it say something like that? God finds fault? The people. The people, them is literally what it says, but the people. Yeah. God finds fault not with the covenant per se. It's not that the covenant was designed to fail. Or that the covenant was inherently inadequate. It was rather the people that God made the covenant with. <laughs> That's where the problem was. Right? So it says God finds fault with them. Right? And then we get we get an explanation of the them when we read Jeremiah 31. Because he goes right into the quotation when he says God finds fault with them when he says. So he's going to tell us 
he's going he what i think he's telling us is jeremiah tells us exactly who he finds fault with right. where do you see that in this quotation of jeremiah verse nine in what way they did not remain faithful okay and who was that who's he talking about the people that he led out of egypt ah that have we run into those people who he led out of Egypt before in Hebrews? Yeah. yeah. Remember back in chapter 3? They were in the wilderness. And they had an evil heart of unbelief. And they did not hear the good news with faith. But they heard the good news with unbelief. God made this covenant with Israel and Judah at Sinai. And he led them out of Egypt, redeemed them from slavery, and they did not continue in my covenant. They broke the covenant. And that broke his heart. Yeah, broke God's heart. There's a, a way of talking about the effect of that. So the problem is a broken covenant. And a broken covenant means leave, you know, they sin. And they died, and they died in the wilderness because of their rebellion. And so that language in Jeremiah, in thinking about that uh, generation that came out of Egypt and the generation that rejected God, did not receive the promise, did not embrace the promise, the Sabbath rest, that they rejected it. And that's why the covenant uh, the covenant needs renewal because now what we have is a continual process of sin and death and sacrifices, sin and death and sacrifices. And, and that ongoing offering, the continual offering, the continual remembrance of the sin in the story of Israel. So what, what is the solution when you come to verse 10? How are we, how are we hearing that? Yeah, we're going to get a new one. So this, this first one, they've, they've broken the miscovenant. What's going to, how is God going to fix that? What, is, what does it tell us in Jeremiah 31 how God's going to fix that? Going to write them on our hearts. Where, where is it written in the first stone, the covenant? Yeah, stone. In fact, we get we get that in chapter nine that it was that the stone tablets are in the ark of the covenant. So it's written on stone. Now it's going to be written on the heart. What else is going to be different here? They will be his people. Okay, there, there's a promise. I'm going to leave that one in verse 10. You're right, that there's, that there's a promise to that, that there's going to be a relationship. But what else is, what's going to be? Everybody's going to know. Ah, uh, every, everyone knows. Everyone knows God. What is it? How is that true over here? Not in that wilderness generation, right? That wilderness generation had unbelief. They, they rejected God. They didn't know God. Because knowing God here is about intimacy. It's not about knowledge. It includes knowledge because intimacy includes knowledge, right? But intimacy is more than just knowledge. It's relational. It's connection. It's communion. Um, so everyone will know me. Not know about me, per se, but know, be in relation with me, be in relationship with me. But that wasn't true into the first one. What else is different? See anything else? It's forgiven. Ah, well, there's going to be a promise of forgiveness. Here, there's going to be remember no more. What was going on in Israel in terms of their sin? What, why did they offer sacrifices? There? Why was the Yom Kippur, Kippur there, the Day of Atonement? What is that supposed to do? Wash away their sins. 
largely to forgive them, but also remember them. All right. So there was this annual remembrance. But now there's going to be no more. Right? So what we have is kind of an internalization, writing the law in the heart as opposed to the stone. Broken, but here, what, what Jeremiah is envisioning is no one's going to, everybody's going to know God. This is going to be healed. Or you might say, people are going to do the work of the God. They're going to do the word of the Lord. They're going to obey. They're going to have their lives filled with, with obedience and that's why God writes the law on the heart, so that it would flow from a natural obedience, that it would just be second nature to us to obey. Because that's what our hearts are. We do what our hearts are, right? Kind of thing. And here, no need to teach. Whereas here, it was constant teaching, right? You're not going to have to, what Jeremiah envisions is a time when you don't have to teach anybody. Oh, that raises some questions. Then. Like, well, when is this new covenant happening? Because <laughs> if we don't need to teach anybody, let's just go home right now. You know, we don't need any teaching. Uh, but that, that's a good question. I want to come back to that in just a moment. Now, those are the differences that Jeremiah envisions. What's the continuity he envisions? What's the sameness that's in the text of Jeremiah? What's the same between first and second, between first and new? What's, what's the same? Ah, the same promise. We're going to, oh, how do I do this? Okay. We're going to do the same. Okay. Got the same promise. I will be their God and they will be my people. That That's in Leviticus 26. That's in Genesis 17. It's in Exodus 6. It's part of the covenant relationship between Israel and God, that I will be your God and you will be my people. But it's also in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, which actually quotes Leviticus 26. I will be your God and you will be my people for we are the temple of God. And it's in the eschaton, it's in the new heaven and new earth in Revelation 21. Now the dwelling of God is, with, is among humanity. I will be their God and they will be my people. So it's the same promise from Abraham to the new heaven and new earth. Same promise. No difference. What else is same? Who's talking? Who's doing the talking? You could say Jeremiah. Yeah, that's true. But the yeah, the Lord. We got we got the same God. The God of the second covenant is the same God as the God of the, new, of the first covenant. We didn't switch gods. All right? We didn't chuck one God and get another one. But the God of Israel is the God who is the God of the Messiah. The God of Jesus is the God of Israel. As much as we want to put some kind of wedge between those two, God of quote unquote Old Testament, God of the New Testament. There's no wedge there. It's the same God. This God who entered into covenant with Israel is the same God who makes new covenant. What else is the same? Anything else the same? Who's he making it with? Does he specify the people? Says Israel and Judah, then. So the same people. 
this new covenant is made with Israel and Judah. With the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. You know, Jeremiah, remember, the, egg, the northern kingdom's already gone into exile. The southern kingdom's about to go into exile. And God says, I'll make a new covenant with Israel and Judah. <clears throat> People of God. And that's exactly kind of what we see in, say, Paul, when he talks about how Israel is an olive tree and Gentiles are grafted into it. We become part of the people of Israel. We become part of that tree. We're not a new, we're not a um, de novo people, wholly newly created people. We're not replacing Israel. We are joining Israel. We are being grafted into Israel. Israel is still the people of God, and we're being grafted into Israel. The new covenant is not made with Gentiles. The new covenant is made with Israel and Judah and includes Gentiles. And Gentiles are grafted into Israel and Judah. So it's still the same people that God is going to make a new covenant with. Is there another same? You see another same in the text? This one maybe gets hidden to us a little bit because we do talk about old law and new law, even though that language is not in the Bible. What's going to be put into our hearts? Spirit. Uh, doesn't say spirit here, though. I mean, Ezekiel talks about the spirit being put into our hearts. Yeah, and Paul does. The law. The, law. the same law. The same law. I will put my laws in their hearts. I'm not going to invent new laws. I'm going to put my laws, the laws you already know, in your in their hearts. The laws that are on the stone, I'm going to take the laws that are on the stone and I'm going to write them on the heart. Same laws. So the sense of continuity here is really important. Same God, same promise, same laws, same people. But the difference is also important. Because it's the difference that makes it new. Yeah, Pete. Yeah. I've heard you talk a lot about chapter 5 and 4. You also mentioned 9. Mm -hmm. Would it be possible that ch chapter 8 would go between these two, what you've been talking about? Well, yeah, I think it's the middle part of the argument. So chapter 8 is the middle part of this didactic section from you know we started in chapter 5 1 and then we have that detour in you know 6 and come back to the argument in 7 so 8 is kind of the the middle part of the argument the main point right? the main point is we have a high priest who is enthroned in the heavens serving in the heavenly sanctuary that's the main point mm -hmm. and it is that service that gives us a new covenant a new relationship now think about think about this newness here is this your experience in christ no yeah. we still teach each other right do we still sell each other um hey you need to know god yeah do we tell each other that do we have we forgotten our sins are we totally healed is our heart is the is the law of God written on our heart in a full, complete way? Yeah. Uh, see, I, I think that what we're talking about here, that this that these promises are what like the scholars like to call eschatological. That is, these promises belong to the reality the perfected reality that will that God will accomplish through Christ when we are perfected. That when we are perfected, that is when we are raised with Christ and we live in the new heaven and new earth, whatever that is, when we are perfected, we will remember our sins no more. 
and that we will be perfected in the sense that the law is written on our hearts in a fully realized way. That we will never again break the covenant. So that's what God's fixing with the new covenant. He's, he's making a new covenant so that they won't break it again. <laughs> but man, we break it all the time. Right? But the point of the new covenant is that, that we will be perfected in such a way that we won't break the covenant again. And we won't need, we won't be remembering our sins. And we won't, everyone will know, everyone will have intimacy with God, which isn't true now. So I think of this as belonging to the eschaton or the last days, you know, the last, the new heaven and new earth. Now, does that mean it has no application to us? No, I don't think so. I, there is this, um, Paul can talk about it like this, for example. In Romans chapter 8, he can say, we already have an adoption because the Spirit has already been given to us and the Spirit is part of this new covenant sort of thing. But we have already have the Spirit, but we have not yet been fully adopted. That already, not yet. Because God has poured the Spirit upon us, as Ezekiel talks about, which uh, Nancy mentioned a moment ago, Ezekiel 36 talks about the Spirit will give us a new heart, create a new heart in us, that the pouring out of the Spirit is how God creates new hearts. But that's a progressive sort of thing. It's, a, it's something that's in process right now. It's not complete. God is still working on our hearts and forming us. But the new covenant in that sense is already in action. It's just not finished yet. And we know it's not finished because the high priest is still making intercession for us. Right, So it's not finished yet. When the high priest returns, when the high priest comes out of the Holy of Holies and returns to the earth, that's what end of chapter 9 says, when he returns, the first time he came, he came to deliver us, uh, to deal with sin, to make an offering for sin. The second time he comes, he comes for deliverance for full redemption. So I'd want to suggest that what we, that we, we see this as kind of already, but not yet. And that the point here is not about God had this first covenant and so he said, oh, that's a bad covenant. Let's get rid of that one and let's replace it with this one. No, I don't think so. Because new covenant is not about creating something wholly new, like an innovation, but is a renewal. I'm going to, God always had the same goal here, right? Same promise, same goal, just that they broke the covenant. So new covenant is renewing the goal. And when God says, I'm going to make this work. Yeah, Bobby. In verse 13. Yeah. Yeah, verse 13. Very important point. I'm glad you brought it up. And speaking of a new covenant, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and growing old will soon disappear. Obsolete. What is it about the first covenant that's obsolete? It's not the laws, not the God, it's not the people, it's not the promise. The yeah, the, the nature of the priesthood and sacrifice. That's his topic, right? I mean, that's what he's talking about, is priesthood and sacrifices. The change in the law regarding priesthood. Or the adjustment, you might say. Or the amendment, you might say. I mean, there's a lot of maybe metaphors we could use to say this. But it's not like the first covenant was here. And God says, scratch that. We're going to do something altogether new. In fact, 
in the first covenant, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses mm, 6 to 10, something like that. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. Circumcise your hearts that you may love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. Circumcise your hearts. This is what the covenant, this is what I want to do with you. But you didn't do it. You didn't circumcise your hearts. You broke the covenant. So now I'm going to make a new way. I'm going to renew this covenant so that I can accomplish the goal I had for you all along. So I think, Barbara, you're raising a really good question. And this is something that scholars debate. So my opinion is not the final one. Mm -hmm. uh, there are scholars who disagree with me on this. Uh, but what is growing obsolete could be one of two things. A friend of mine, Bobby Valentine, says what's growing obsolete is the brokenness of the covenant. That that's growing obsolete. That is, that we have a that we are a people who break the covenant all the time. No, that's growing obsolete because God is in process of healing us and writing His law on our hearts, and so the first covenant is growing obsolete. That's possible. Um, I think it's also possible that what's growing obsolete is the secession of the Levitical priesthood. But that's growing old. That's well, that's worn out. In fact, that's kind of the word we have here, growing old and obsolete, actually. It's a word that refers to clothes wearing out. It's the same word used in Hebrews 1, verse 11, when, when it talks about God doesn't wear out, right? Or his life doesn't wear out. Let me finish this point. Repeat. Um, so it's the priesthood. Maybe he's even anticipating the destruction of Jerusalem. And the secession of the priesthood. Maybe. Maybe he's writing after the destruction of Jerusalem. And he's saying, that's gone away. That priesthood is gone. Uh, and even rabbis today talk about, yeah, we don't have that priesthood anymore. So what we do is we pray. And our prayers are incense before God. And God forgives us through prayer. Because we don't have the Levitical priesthood anymore. But our preacher wants to tell us that now... God, God is still um, still has a priesthood in play, and it's the messianic priesthood. It's the heavenly priesthood. It's the priesthood that makes intercession for us continually, and that's the newness of the covenant. So yeah, and it's a real. I think it's a it's a difficult question about okay, what is obsolete? What's going away? I think the bottom line for me is that the new covenant is not a replacement. We're not talking about replacing covenants. We're talking about the transformation of the covenant, the renewal of the covenant. The covenant is made new again, but it's the same covenant. It's the same God with the same people, with the same promise, with the same laws. And God is renewing that covenant in order to fulfill God's goal, which was always his goal, that a people would know him and that they would have his laws on their heart and that they would have no more sin. So hear the promise of Jeremiah, and he will, I will remember their sins no more. When is that going to happen? I mean, God can read his Bible and remember sin, right? Yeah. Uh, and we read our own stories and we remember sin. We remember sin. That's part of our struggle to heal, isn't it? That we have so many, we have shame and we have regrets. And, but there's going to be a day when we will remember our sins no more because God will remember our sins no more. Pete, you get the last word, Pete. It would be right. I would be hopeful. Yeah, but I know it's not going to be. Huh? Talk about the law back there. I always go back to what Paul said. Even back in those days, there's a remnant. It's like an end. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a remnant, and God is, and there's a remnant of Israel. Now, um, that's who God made the covenant with was Israel, 
And we Gentiles are grafted into that so that we become children of Abraham by faith in the Messiah of Israel. So, it's, you know, we need to talk maybe something sometime about Israel because I don't think Israel is the nation state in in the Middle East. That's not Israel. Right? That, that, that's a whole different topic, but I'm talking about the children of Abraham. Huh? The people. Yeah. yeah, the people. People are, are Israel. Right? Well, thank you for being here. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Thank you.